You're listening to Out of the Box with Rosie Tran. If you guys enjoy us, please subscribe on iTunes and Stitcher and leave comments. They really, really help. I'm here today with the author of Create Your Own Religion, Danelli Bellelli. Danelli, how are you today? Good. How are you doing? Um, I'm doing great. It's actually a beautiful SoCal day, and we're just re- relaxing and enjoying life. Nice. <laughs> not a bad deal. Nice, nice, nice. Um, so I have not read your book yet, but I, it's on my Amazon list. <laughs> You're a bad person. I know. I am a bad person, but it's on my list, and I'm going to have you back after I finish it for an even more in-depth discussion. (laughs) But I know that um, you have the motto of kind of taking what works for people and leaving what doesn't. Mm -hmm. And you know, very Bruce Lee-like, I guess. (laughs) Well, I think it's important because my experience with religion has been... um, I I don't know your background with Mm -hmm. religion, uh, but I grew up in a house that was mixed religions. My I had Buddhist in my family. I had Jehovah's Witness. I had all sorts of religions, and I grew up very cynical because I felt like this is all bullshit. It Mm -hmm. doesn't make sense. Everyone has different opinions, and some people weren't living the things that they were preaching. Right, and that really bothered me. So then I went into this atheist um, area of my life for many years. But I felt like I was missing something Mm -hmm. because I wasn't experiencing that spirituality. And I think that that's a lot of people I know are atheists and they're so intelligent. Mm -hmm. Um, But they almost become religious in a way because they're so anti-religious that they just preach what they're. It's like they spend so much time trying to prove that God doesn't exist. Right. that, (laughs) That they don't realize that spirituality is a part of like who we are yeah i mean i don't trust anybody who's too sure of their conclusions when it comes to this stuff <laughs> i agree you know it's like if you feel that strongly about stuff and you feel 100 percent certain of what's going on eh, i don't think you got it because life is so weird and complicated and ultimately mysterious then assuming that you have the answers I already know you're wrong. (laughs) (laughs) And and it's not to say that you can't have uh, some convictions or feelings or uh, whatever. The problem is uh, I I don't feel that... um, I feel that you have to tread carefully when it comes to conclusions about things like this. I think that conclusions can become a prison in a way. It can become something that is... um, becomes a dogma ultimately rather than being something that you go moment by moment and you make a judgment call based in that situation in that moment what works and what doesn't uh, feelings which may be completely legitimate but they are not the same as an objective truth that falls from the sky those things are totally fine but when you start feeling that you have this hard you have the truth you own the truth yeah good luck with that I agree with that completely. And I think what I was missing when I was atheist was that I was so judgmental Mm -hmm. of people that did have a spirituality or religion. And I didn't realize, and I've noticed this in a lot of atheist friends of mine, which is why, um, well, right now I'm religious science, Mm -hmm. um, which I, which works for me. But, um, what I was missing out was that there's a whole, I think a lot of people grow up in traditional religions, Mm -hmm. which don't land true for them and then they dismiss right. religion altogether right and what happens is that they miss that there's a lot of positives sure. and a lot of great things and so i once i started studying um other religions and actually getting into them and seeing that there's a lot of similarities and positives but there's also a lot of man-made stuff mm-hmm. which people don't you know take into account either is you know people who are on the other side who are so religious that they can't see past their own religion it's like okay these, I'm not denying these disciples didn't exist or that these people didn't exist, but they're people. Right. Absolutely. They're making up their own judgments. Absolutely. And that's the problem with it, that sometimes the arguments about this kind of thing are arguments about semantics. They're not even arguments about real stuff. They are like when people are believing God, don't believe in God. What the hell does that mean anyway? It's like, what does, when you say God, what the hell are we talking about? You know, you have the people who define it in a Santa-like kind of way, you know, the wise man in the sky who knows uh, everything you do that's good, everything you do that's bad. You have the ones who define it more in a Taoist, uh, you know, an energy force, a field in a way that's not personal, doesn't have a personality. And so there are all these different definitions under the one word, God, and to assume that 
you know, whenever somebody throw it out there, I'm just like, well, which one of the 17,000 <laughs> variations? Because they don't mean the same thing at all. They don't even come close. So, Well, I think some of them are the same thing, but people are calling them different things. And I think people become very attached to one definition. Sure. So I've met people. So my definition of God is more Taoist. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think that God is just an energy. Call it Mother Nature. You sure. can call it whatever you want. It's an energy. Right. And it, you know, I think I believe you have the energy inside you. I have that energy. And I think that um, that we're given. I try, because I grew up in a very negative religious household. Mm -hmm. I grew up in New Orleans, which is a very Catholic city. A lot of my friends had severe Catholic guilt. They would go and do horrible things and then go to confession sure and it didn't cure the guilt right of course, <laughs> of course. however i do think that there are aspects which is why i love the idea of create your own religion i do think there's positive aspects in every even old dogmatic types of religion for example i don't believe that confessing your sins cures you sure. of that guilt however i do think that talking about your problems makes them better sure and so in that way confession can be sure 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 a positive and that's why you know when you go into the specifics that's where it gets more interesting because if it's about pro or against religion pro or against god however defined that may be it's a bullshit discussion because there's no we don't we are not even talking about the same things you know if we're talking about specifics, that's where it gets interesting. You know, it talks about... Well, let's about, talk about specifics. Yeah, it's like that particular, <laughs> you know, and that's kind of what I do with Creator on Religion is I pick, uh, I forget how many, 10, 15, whatever many topics they are. Each chapter is dedicated to one particular topic and it's uh, anything from sex, uh, attitudes toward uh, the earth and the relationship with nature, uh, gender roles, uh, the afterlife, the you know all the big things that whether you are talking about a philosophy or a religion, everybody has to answer one way or another. And uh, looking at what the kind of answers are out there, you know, this is what some religions emphasize when it comes to this topic. This is what other religions emphasize. And at the end of the day, on an individual level, look at the answers. See, ooh, this one leads to some really unhealthy crap, at least from my point of view. So no thanks. I got rid of these. <laughs> this one looks pretty good. Okay, I'll borrow that. Or maybe none of them look good, but you come up to your own by default, by seeing what you don't like, and you figure out what it is that you like instead. Well, before we go on, I just want people to know where can they get your book in case they're interested. Amazon, uh, probably if you still find bookstores around, uh, if they still <laughs> exist somewhere, yes, probably, you know, Barnes & Noble, that kind of thing. Yes, go but, on Amazon and check it out. I will too. And then we'll we'll have uh, Mr. Bellelli back and we'll we'll discuss more. So good. Uh, um, uh, so what I, what I wanted to know what your opinion is about is I, I have a lot of friends who grew up a certain way, mm -hmm. you know, say, let's just pick an arbitrary religion. Say they grew up Baptist. Sure. And they don't agree with any of the concepts of baptism, but they call themselves Baptists or they say, well, I grew sure. up Baptist, but I'm not really a Baptist, but I'm a Baptist. I feel like there's this attachment to labels. Like people feel almost socially because that's the way they grew up. That's how yep. their whole family is. And they just feel so attached that they're scared to like go out there and see that there's other things that might fit their beliefs. That's one of the problems with identity in general, not even just about religion, it's about identity, about the need to define yourself in some specific terms that require belief in specific ideas. You know, it's kind of like if you go to the bookstore, again, if they exist, and you find, <laughs> you know, the, your book has to be under a particular label, right? It has to be either it's in religion or it's in philosophy or it's And it's fiction, not in the area that it, you think. And exactly, and it's like that label is like, yeah, that's a big part of it, but there's so much more to that, right? And I think that a lot of time when people hug their own identity too tight in those terms by embracing a label, you are doing a disservice to your complexity as a human being because the reality is that you may have some aspects with which you agree with what stereotypically that label is about, but then there are a million other ways where you don't practice, that you don't feel that way. You are a different beast and you are a mix of many different influences. So this clinging to some kind of an identity because otherwise you are lost, I think being lost would be a good start because that's where you can build yourself. And Either that's where than, you can find yourself. Exactly. Yeah. It's um, as uh, what was Tolkien, uh, not all 
how does how's that quote go uh not all those who wander are lost <laughs> 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 Some of us love wandering. Yeah, and uh, you know, there's that idea of um, just—I don't know. I'm—I have issues with the idea of identity itself, whether it's an ethnic identity, whether it's a religious identity, on a philosophical level. Clinging too tightly to any one label tells me that you are not really exploring what it means to be a human being fully. I think it's an insecurity because people. My experience is that people that do that. They want to feel included or they mm -hmm. want to belong. And yep. it's too scary for them to be out of the boundaries of society or their family. And you know what? It is hard because I definitely don't fit into a stereotype. And people always question me. You know, right. usually when I'm a stand-up comedian and usually when I'm out and about, I'm pretty quiet. Right. And people are always... It's always the same type of people. Usually it's a very strong male energy. They just cannot believe that an Asian woman sure. would talk. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> and it just, it, when, when I tell them that I'm a stand up, it literally looks like their head is going to explode. <laughs> yep. No, of course. Of course. Because it's all about, that's why stereotypes are popular, because people are familiar with stereotypes. It's easy to deal with a stereotype. You, you have a sense of what you can expect. If in, it's, it's good because it's, it allows you to be lazy. It's like, oh, I can plug you in my mental category of Asian woman, certain age. It means you're going to be like this, this, and that. And it's like, that's not how real human beings work. Or rather, some do, which is sad, <laughs> right? When people actually fit stereotypes to a T, that's pretty sad. Well, also, I think, uh, I think a lot of people don't fit stereotypes exactly. and they play them. Right. They play them to feel... Because I've met so many people. You know, I know a, a lot of big guys that <clears throat> look tough. Right. And... The stereotype is that they're tough, they don't cry, this and that, but it's it's almost, I mean, I don't want to say absolute truths, but it's almost to a T that every single time I meet a guy like that and I really get to know him, he's just a big softy sure. and it's a big front because he's physically big, so he feels like he has to play this character of right. being a big tough guy. And it's like, um, people, I don't know why as a society we keep playing these these roles and these this person is like this and this person like this and i notice that even people will try to deny if you are against a stereotype they believe they will even try to deny you that right like i usually am very like chipper mm -hmm. and so whenever i'm having a negative feeling i have certain friends who accept that and they'll be very accepting and non-judgmental and i have some friends well why are you upset you're always happy well i'm right. a human being and yeah, i have yeah. this whole range of emotions of course and because i'm not fitting what they see me as it upsets them <laughs> No, and that's the thing, that you may be more than one thing. It's like we the big are. guy, you know, it, um, yesterday I was recording with Tate Fletcher, was, uh, he personify exactly that. He's a guy who can probably kill you with his bare hands easily, <laughs> you know, no problem. And uh, he's not just can, he's a guy who, in the right situation, may just be strangling you if you piss him off enough. And at the same time, so he has that tough, you know, hardcore, you know, it's not just the front of how he looks, he's also That's the his real energy. deal. Yeah. And at the same time, he's not at all. His energy is, in fact, I'm trying to, I'm trying really hard not to entitled the episode uh, a big sweetie because that's how he is right <laughs> his, his whole heart he's really sweet guy he has both he's both people and he's not schizophrenic he's not like he's no we all from are we all have the he's, whole range exactly he has unlike many people who may have the same range but smaller you know a little sweet and a little tough but not really much of either he's really tough and really sweet <laughs> you know and depending on the situation he's gonna bring out a certain energy more than another well, I think that we all have... Well, so first of all, if you guys don't know what we're talking about, um, Danelli is the host of a wonderful podcast called The Drunken Taoist. Mm -hmm. And you guys can subscribe to that as well. Um, but I think that we all actually not have everything, but we have that capacity. And I believe that everything is balanced. So there has to constantly be balance one way or the, the other. And the universe or society or your brain or whatever you want to call it will create that balance whether you want it or not so usually if someone is pretty centered then you know they're whole and complete or whatever but if someone is really extreme one way i i feel like it's so impossible to be that way that they have to have the counter yeah. right because yeah. things need to be kind of like the scales need to be in the break so i've noticed like people that tend to be um uh very dismissive of something it's something about themselves that they're dismissing mm -hmm. you know like i know 
I know so many guys that I've met that are so homophobic and anti-gay, sure. anti-whatever, and then it turns out, you know, 10, 20 years later, they're gay. As Joe Rogan would put it. Yes, <laughs> <definitely>. <laughs> or, yes. or there's, you know, people that I've met who are so you know against something and they just they're just so against it and then it turns out it's something about themselves that no, they're against of course, of course. right so anytime someone is so one way or so the other you have to look below the surface and say what is going on here because usually it's not you know we're all books with multiple multiple pages mm-hmm. and i just i tend to be dismissive of people who are too dismissive sure because it's like you're not looking at the full picture people are just so complicated and every every single time i have been steadfast about one opinion right the universe has kicked my ass sure absolutely (laughs) and brought me the other opinion for me to wake up yeah (laughs) because this life is you know we like we like to think of life as simple because it's complicated enough that we try to simplify it and bring it back to terms that we can say it's like this and that way if i just follow this path everything will be easy and the reality is that no. that's <laughs> yeah it doesn't work that way it's very ultimately lazy because life is like surfing i guess you have to constantly adapt it doesn't mean that you have to stay on that spot on the board the entire time because the energy of the wave is changing and as the energy of the wave changes you have to throw yourself slightly off balance one way and then you go slightly off balance the other way and that's how you keep balance you don't keep balance by staying straight the entire time in the middle right that's how you wipe out yeah exactly <laughs> it's like you have to constantly go Ooh, adapt here no now you have to feel it you can go by a dogma you can go by an ideology of if you always steal to the left by 30 degrees is always going to work no it doesn't it works in this second Ooh, now this second if you still tilt to the left 30 degrees you're in the water you have to tilt the other way you have to and uh, the reason why most people don't like to do it is because it takes too much work you know it's kind of like uh, if you have ever been around uh, somebody who's really good at cooking when you ask for a recipe they can't right they half just of cook, the time right? it's just like well you put <laughs> a pinch of this a yeah of that. and you're like what the hell is that how much is a pin and, you know you, you cook it until it's a little brown is like what's a little you know it doesn't that's how mean my anything, mom right? does my mom drives me nuts she gives my me and my sister recipes and when we make it it doesn't taste the same of course because it's <laughs> she does it by taste and you go by nose you go by now it's like you are not looking at the clock you're not looking at how much in a by measuring cup now recipes are useful when you don't know what you're doing the way they get you somewhat in a the guideline. ballpark of doing something right but to do it really well, you have to go beyond the recipe and you have to make, you go by nose, you know, go by that that exact moment. It smells right. Now we're going to go with it, you know. I, I also want to discuss because it's something that bothers me and a lot of my friends that are kind of working on themselves and doing stuff like this. Every single person, actually, so many people, I, I would say 99% of the people I talk to that have worked on themselves or done some work or spiritual um, search or wandering or whatever you want to call it have said this. And I just don't understand, and you're in education as well, so maybe you can help me out on this. It seems like our belief systems um, control or at least highly affect the way that we view the world Mm -hmm. and the way that we act and the way that we treat others and everything like this. Yet, logically looking at belief systems is not something that's taught. And I would say that it's more important than science. It's more important than math. It's more because some people don't go into fields that involve math. Sure. And some people don't go into fields that involve science. And some people don't involve, go into fields that involve art and every single subject that's taught. Yes. But every single person in the world deals with other people, deals with the way that they look at the world, deals with their own belief system. So it's something that's universal. It's a topic and a subject that's universal in every single person's life. And whereas the main topics that are taught in schools are not. Right. Yet we don't look at critically looking at our belief system. Yeah. And we don't teach children that. And then that creates hate and war and bigotry. And like you said, self-identification with one thing or another. And to me, it just seems like we're not teaching people skills. Sure. Almost. Yeah. Because to teach people skills, you would be teaching wisdom, for lack of a better word. And wisdom, by definition, is there's an element of it that's subjective. It's not entirely, clearly, everybody agree on what wisdom is. 
And what that means is that schools are designed to be objective, have measurable outcomes. We can have standardized testing, you know, all of that kind of crap that, yes, you... It is crap. It, it is, because <laughs> it, the kind of stuff that you can measure objectively is dates and names and, you know, it's stuff that doesn't really say anything. It says something about your ability to remember stuff. How many hoops do you jump through to make sure you remember the stuff on time for the exam and all of that? He's not saying anything about your real understanding of the universe or... There are some. There's philosophy classes and things like that. But in... even that, a lot of it is not really about... Like, it's not most... A philosophy class is not really asking you to create anything. It's asking you to... What does a philosopher so-and-so say, say? And how yeah. would you compare to philosopher so-and-so? And it's like... Who the fuck cares? You know, it's like, <laughs> I mean, that's, yeah, that's interesting, but not that much. You know, it's like there's a lot more to it. But I do think you can teach wisdom. I do think that because that, I think you can, but not in that context. I not in a context that requires you to be 110% objective because there's some of it is, some of it is not, right? Well, I think that's kind of what's, to lack of a better word, what's messed up with society because, you know, if you study history, that's what used to happen. You know, they had a the Aesop's fables right. and that would teach life lessons yep. and they had. And so that has kind of gone off to people teaching quote unquote life lessons in church or in outside of school. And I think every child should know about these things. Absolutely. And um, yeah, but it boils down to that fear of being sued, that fear of uh, <laughs> somebody's going to be pissed <laughs> off that, you know, the, they say that this is the way to be a good life lesson and this wisdom, but that goes against my belief, blah, 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 blah. So screw you guys. You're just pushing your agenda, you know, that kind of thing. But I don't think that I, I agree with you. I totally agree with you. And I see that's why, because I think we have gotten to PC and a lot of people, there have been lawsuits and people get scared and right. you can't be objective. But I think there is an ob objective way to teach wisdom by saying, by, I guess, prefacing it as this is a point of view. Sure. You know, this is someone's point of view and this is another point of view and this right. is another point of view and letting kids decide for themselves. Right. But I don't think it's a, it's a, it, I don't think we're giving our kids a fair chance by not even letting them know what the choices are. Sure. I agree. I completely agree. It's like, how can, it's like, how can you make an objective decision about something when you don't know what the choices are? Yep. Agreed. And that's, that's kind of my create your own religion approach is look at what the choices are. This is what they say about this topic. This is what these other guys say about this topic. What do you make of it? What's your choice among once you have all these different answers laid in front of you, where do you want to go with it? Which one sound right to you? Which one doesn't? Why is that is? Or maybe they mold the one does or maybe none of them do and you have to figure out your own. Well, the crazy thing is it changes the older you get. Of course. <laughs> and again, that's why like sticking to a dogma too tightly, you're robbing yourself of the chance to change your mind. As uh, new facts come in, as you learn more, and you're like, you know what? That did make sense at some point. Not so much anymore. It's so crazy because, you know, I'm turning 30 in two days. Mm -hmm. And I just remember having... Oh, I'm turning 40 tomorrow. Really? Yeah. So you're uh, January 12th? J no, January 11th. Oh, no way. We have, we have the, the same, same birthday. birthday. Yeah, <laughs> it's tomorrow, by the way, your birthday. Just yeah, in case sorry. You're I'm, I, I thought today was the 9th. Um... So we have the same birthday. Oh, that's so weird. <clears throat> that is weird. That that's yeah. magical. Yeah. It's it's great. Let's that's not weird. That's weird has a negative connotation, I think. It's that's amazing. January eleventh, so you're nineteen eighty four? Yes. Nineteen seventy four? Yep. What's up? I know. Crazy. <laughs> crazy, crazy, crazy. How do you say happy birthday in Italian? Buon compleanno. Buon compleanno. Yeah. I took an Italian class at a Valley College and I did not do very well. <laughs> I love Italian. I think it's so romantic. And I went to, me and my husband actually went to Italy for our honeymoon. Mm -hmm. We went to Venice and Rome and we want to go back. Um, I always wanted to learn as many uh, languages as I could. Mm -hmm. And I'm struggling now that my adult brain is a little bit slower than my childhood of course, brain. <laughs> of course. So I have a little French and I have Vietnamese and I have English and I'm working on the other ones. But um. Oh man, how, you that's a lot. That's a lot. That's right a lot now. already. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> no, I mean I speak Italian. I speak English. I understand Spanish because you know it's almost it's similar. Like Italian, so it's like I understand it. I can't really speak it because if I start speaking it, I, Italian comes out. <laughs> but I get it. So I'm I'm at two and a half. That's where I'm at. <laughs> I know how to say "como se dice." Say "como se dice." 
<laughs> and then point to things on the menu. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Um, yeah. So I so ten years ago, you know, I had beliefs. Even two years ago, even a year and a half ago, mm-hmm. I had even beliefs. Three minutes. Even ago, three minutes right. ago, I had beliefs that, which is why, when people, like you said, are so steadfast to something. I just question them because if you're really open minded and you really are open, because there was a time where I was more close minded and the universe wasn't sending me the lessons that it is now. Right. And the more open I am, the more um, lessons just keep coming my way to the point where I I was so atheist. And now I'm I'm just like, OK, there has to be a God because there's no way <laughs> there's no way these lessons. You know, I remember right. I, I had a girlfriend and I got into a, a fight with her because I was I ha- I have like a a rough relationship with my mother, mm-hmm. so I was telling her you know she was saying well you just need to be compassionate with her you mm-hmm. just need to be empathetic you just need to be compassionate and I was so mad because I feel like my mom doesn't um, value herself mm-hmm. and it just bothers me oh she, it doesn't it just bothers me she doesn't value herself and she doesn't get it right and she kept saying you just have to be compassionate with her you just have to have empathy and I would get so mad at her and then that week. A very similar situation happened to me where I saw that I wasn't valuing myself. Mm-hmm. And it was like God just slapped me in the face. And I realized kind of what I was saying about, you know, the people who are really homophobic. I was so resistant sure. to my mom not valuing herself because that's an issue I have with myself. Sure, sure, sure. So it's like whatever. It sounds so cheesy. It sounds so the secret and the, you know, mm-hmm. power of attraction, whatever. But it's it's basic psychology. Whatever you're seeing in other people, you're projecting, you're putting out, or vice versa, or whatever. A lot of the time. A lot of it. Not and then all the somebody's time. just an asshole, right? <laughs> somebody's just them. <laughs> but I mean, well, then you don't attract those people. You kick them out right. and lock the door. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, in general, the things that you notice, let's just say the things that you notice more. Right. It's You notice it because it's a little bit a part of yourself. I think a lot of the time, yes, absolutely. I don't know if all of the time, because sometimes don't know something, time. you know, you notice something just because it's so like, hey, how can you pot you? That's just so screwed <laughs> up, you know? It's like, and you notice that too, but doesn't mean it's in you. But a lot of it, I agree with you. And, and ultimately, the one that's more interesting is the one that is in you because then you can do something about it. Whereas the other one is just, well, that guy is an ass. And that's <laughs> why, you know? But that's once you're done saying it, that doesn't help you a lot. Uh, is someone being asked you right now, Janelle? <laughs> no, but I mean, I have, like, there's a good chunk of humanity that on a routine basis I would like to machine gun. If I, so it's like, that's, uh, it's an ongoing thing. It's not at any particular moment. <laughs> well, we just avoid those people, so then we don't attract them. <laughs> sure, or have a good machine gun handy. <laughs> um, <laughs> machine gun. Uh, that reminds me. On that note... <laughs> On that note, no, because uh, my dad was, uh, he's a Vietnam War vet and he used to have a machine gun in the closet. <laughs> I mean, everybody needs one, right? How can... So whenever you say machine gun, I think about that because I don't know how many people, found, you know, g- go in their dad's office and find a machine gun in the closet. Yeah, what's life without a machine gun in your closet? <laughs> um, so how did you start on this path? What What created you on this path? Because usually... I mean, may, you know, maybe you're like an extremely enlightened person. I don't know. But my experience has been <laughs> usually when people go on the path, it's because something happens or they have an experience that kind of wakes them up or, you know, the universe or God or whatever kind of gives them a little push in the direction. Um, not that I can think of. I think it's just uh, the way I grew up. Uh, I've always said a certain um, the way I was raised, the way my father, my mother are. There's a lot of um, pride in being weird. Pride <laughs> in, no, literally, okay. just doing things differently. And not just because you're a pain in the ass doing things differently, but questioning things. You know, the fact that any norm that's push your way, question it. Doesn't mean always reject it, because sometimes you question and you're like, yeah, that makes sense. I'll, I'll do it. No, I but, think that's a good way to uh, look at things. I think, I mean, I'm not... I think I think some people think questioning is a bad thing, but even in traditional religions, mm-hmm. there's questioning, and that's what kind of bothers me about people who follow things blindly. Like if you if even if you read the Bible, right? So say you're just a traditional conventional sure. Christian. Even if you read the Bible, every single person that God chose in the Bible was someone who was a rebel. Mm-hmm. You know, Jesus was freaking crucified. Yeah. He was a yeah, rebel. Yeah, yeah. Of course, every single person in the Bible is someone who said. What's going on in my time and day does not make sense. Exactly. And that shows you right there how 
why there's I have issues with a lot of human beings is because most people never ever do it if you look at what's considered normal in any given society at any at some point in time you move even in that same society 200 years later those values are looked at as like i can't believe those freaks used to do that, <laughs> you know? and yet you know now it's like 90 percent of people felt one way at that time and now 90 percent of people feel completely the opposite way about the same topic that shows you that the vast majority of people just go with, with whatever is taught to them. And whatever is common in their society at that moment is what they go by. Once enough people criticize it and you reach a critical mass, then suddenly the floodgates open, everybody jump on the bandwagon, and the thing that used to be great now is terrible, or vice versa. Well, that's true. I mean, 100 years ago, we used leeches yeah, as medicine. You know, course. 50 years ago, we were doing shock therapy to cure people, quote unquote, of mental illness. Of course. So that's another reason I actually, because when I was atheist, I was very um, in that scientific world. And I think a lot of people who are scientific are so attached to that um, in intelligence level. And they're like, well, this is proven. This is shown. And I, I actually question science more than anything else because of course. science is constantly evolving. Of you can't say, well, people who are religious, they're just idiots. They're, you know, I believe in science. Well, you know, there are scientific studies that completely contradict each other. Absolutely. And they have full proof yep. and they've done, you know, blind tests with control subjects and they have complete opposite results. Absolutely. <laughs> and it's, you know, it, it is a work in progress to think that suddenly the science discovered in the last 30 years is it and everything before that. Well, you know, those guys didn't quite have it yet. It's uh, clearly being too stuck in the present because the reality is that, as you said, you know, practices, scientific or medical practices that were normal a century ago are laughed at now. And practices that were done five years ago that were considered safe. How many FDA drugs do you see sure. lawsuits for yep. five years later? Yep. And they're saying this is the cure all. This is, and, and that's why I go back to kind of the baseline which is mother nature which is the rules of the universe right that is the only truth i have because first of all a lot of the scientific quote-unquote medicines are synthesized nature sure absolutely they're taking something in a natural plant and they're trying to synthesize it into a pill because the plant has the healing qualities right yep. you know they're trying to take most modern medicines are extracted from nature yep of course of and course. so when people say well this is a modern thing well go back to the natural way sure. why are you going to this chemical that's just manipulating nature right no i mean it's tricky and that's why in fact the scientific you know the scientific method in itself is a very healthy good idea to not fall into superstition and dogmatism and everything because the scientific method is about you have an idea you try it out you test things out you see how that works if it works you hold on to it if it doesn't you go back to the drawing board that's a good way the problem is that in many cases it becomes something that's so open-minded and healthy people can still apply it dogmatically and so everything even within the scientific method it has to be done in a lab under control condition in this and this and such way and you know you're anything that does not come out of a result lab tested yeah. it doesn't exist it's like well do you know good idea you took it too far you know? <laughs> like, it, i'm not denying you know, that basic principle is great but you went way too far with it keep an open mind you know use it without depending on it so much that it becomes your own dogma and and that's the problem that even science can become a dogma well i think what the pro the problem is that a lot of these things are really good concepts but it's the and i i think that there are a lot of positives to humanity but there's also negatives we do have our character flaws you sure. know we aren't perfect, and it's people that are corrupting these things. And I think that's important to note. Science in itself is not evil. Religion in itself is not evil. There's so many positives out of it, but it's the people that corrupt it. You know, if you look at the history of religion, well, religion was used to persecute people and sure. keep people ignorant. But that was the people doing that. It wasn't God doing that. You know, God All didn't... of it. I mean, that's why, yeah. to me, in fact, I'd, um, I tend to stay away from the top god just because again people use it in so many different ways that it's too easy to like uh, which one were you referring to again but when all of it philosophy religion science is all the good and the bad is all man-made right is all like human beings talking about certain ideas embracing them using them to do some amazing sweet stuff using them to do horrible things 
and is all the depending on who you are in what context what's your attitude about it makes all the difference that's why to me somebody tell me that they are whatever they are uh christian muslim communist whatever it doesn't <laughs> tell me it doesn't tell me much you know it doesn't say anything because it's like well that's a very general if you look at christianity within christianity there's everything and its opposite right there are the only thing they all have in common is they all think jesus is a cool guy other than that <laughs> i mean really because w- when you look at it there are gay christians and christians who believe that homosexuality is the worst thing in the universe there are super liberal christians super conservative christian there are you know on every single issue there's disagreement other than really just a couple theological stuff and that's not just true for Christianity, it's true for just about everything else. Yeah, there's radical Muslims and then of there's, course. yeah, there's, you know, if everything you are, has the radical, the conventional, the crazy, the, you know. That's why I'm not anti one particular, like I'm anti more of a general philosophic thing, like something like totalitarianism, you know, somebody who wants their world to impose their worldview on everyone else. That's the disease. I don't care what label you attach to it. You know, there are totalitarian Christian, there are totalitarian Muslim, there are totalitarian people who are no religion whatsoever. You know, if you look at much of communism under Stalin, you look at Nazism, you look at many fascist tendencies. I don't even care whether it's religion, no religion. To me, it's all the same. They are all, they just happen to stumble in that particular version of totalitarianism. But the disease is the same. Is the I own the truth and I'm going to impose it on everyone else whether they like it or not. That's the problem to me. The speci- and those guys, whether you know, they think they hate each other, you know, a fundamentalist Christian will hate a fundamentalist Muslim. But they're Muslim so similar. And, but they are the same. <laughs> they are absolutely the same. They have more in common with each other than uh, somebody who's uh, a much more mellow, Moderate, sweet, yeah. uh, use their religion to just be nice to their neighbor kind of thing with somebody who also uses their philosophy to be nice to their neighbor and is not religious at all. Those- well, that's, that's how I feel about the, my friends that I know that are so atheist and they're so... It's like they talk about religion more than my Christian friends. And, I mean, because they're, no, I and, I, and I'm not saying, you know, like I said, I was atheist and I know atheists who are very, you know, mellow and sure, cool about it. Course. But I'm saying the people who just, well, there's no God and just I believe in science. They're so adamant about it sure. that they're almost as bad as the right wing you know christian anti because they're using that same energy and it's like they're they're having the same belief but just the opposite kind of absolutely that's why it's funny but depending on who i'm around my attitude and where i put my emphasis on what i feel and believe will change radically because if i'm around the people who are all very I don't know, let's say I enjoy martial arts, right? But if I hang out with people who are day and night all about martial arts, <laughs> after a while, I remember having this conversation where I was around these guys, I didn't know them, they were friends of friends, and they were all martial artists, and it's all about technique and style and this and that and the other, and they go on and on and on. And one guy was asking me, oh, do you practice martial arts too? And, you know, I've been doing martial arts forever, but I was like, I remember saying, no, I, I just... <laughs> I hate violence, sorry. You know, it's not my thing. Because to me, it was like, really? That's all we can talk about? Because, oh, we all like martial arts, so let's spend 15 hours talking about how to dislocate an elbow. It's like, really? That's not why I do martial arts. You know, it's fun for five minutes, but then there's something else in life too, you know. But even like, that, there's different There's different types of martial arts. Exactly. There's some that's all about kicking butt. Yeah. There's some that are tournament martial arts. There's some that's all about you know, the, the spiritual energy. There's some martial arts that are very spiritual and about that. So it's like, it depends. That's why it's fun to play with. It's almost like a balancing act. You know, if somebody's, uh, when I'm around people who are super conservatives, I'll be fairly liberal. When I'm around <laughs> people who are super liberal, I'll come out as somewhat conservative, you know, because it's like, it's not that you're wrong because most people, Few people are entirely wrong or entirely right. Most of the stuff they say, there will be some of it where we can get along. And there will be a lot of it where I'm like, yeah, you took a good idea, went so (laughs) far with it that you lost perspective. So I'm not saying that it's all stupid what you're saying, but there's, again, good premise taken too far. But Let's see, bring it back this way a little bit. Okay, that's you know. where I get confused because the more open-minded I am, the more I don't think that there is a side because I used to be very liberal, but then I had conservative friends who had a different point of view 
you know, because I did that too. I was demonizing them. Oh, they're conservatives. Mm-hmm. They're like hate gay people and they're this and sure. that, blah, blah, blah. And they're evil and they're all about corporations. But then I met people who are more on the right who were more libertarian or more, sure. and they had different viewpoints. And I was like, oh, that kind of makes sense. And that- so then the more open minded I am and I see both points of view, I'm like, well, I can see both points right. of view. So then I feel like the more open minded I become, I, I, like you said, people that identify too much, I actually not lose my identity, but I can, I guess, lose my identity because I don't, I'm not attached to one identity. But that's great. Like I can see the different points of view. But that's great. Screw identity. <laughs> no, I mean, because the whole point is not to be the, I'm the faithful follower of this identity or this ideology. It's about making the right call at the right time. Who well, Buddhism hell? says it, like, it's don't like, atta- attachment is the root of all suffering, yeah, right? Who the hell cares whether you are being liberal or conservative at that moment? If you made the right call and people are happy as a result of it, you did the right thing. I don't care to know where it comes from in that sense. It's like, in some cases, you'll pick one type of approach that would fit in this ideological camp. In other cases, you won't at all because it doesn't work in that particular case. So to me, it's like that attachment to an ideology robs you of the flexibility necessary to deal with life or what it is right now you know you're applying some abstract model to every situation the same blindly like they're all the same when they are not and i think that's an issue too with like a lot of times you know they say that there's no common sense anymore because people can't um when they're in that ideology they can't see outside of it like i said the more that i'm looking at other people's viewpoints and becoming more open it's like i almost don't have an identity because i I, I'm like, oh, I can see where you're coming from. I can see where sure. you're coming from. Well, I can see where you're coming from now. And so it, I, I, I feel like right now, you know, I'm in a place where I'm just kind of like buckled into a roller coaster and sure. I'm just letting, I'm just like in the free fall and I'm just letting life come at me because, you know, I thought I kind of had everything figured out. And the more older, the older I get and the more life experiences I have, the more I'm like, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. There's uh... a... <laughs> There's an awesome quote by this uh, Taoist uh, writer, Chuan Tzu. He says, uh, let me see if I remember the quote correctly. The torch of chaos and dubbed is what the, stage steer, what the sage steers by. You know, this idea that, you know, normally we think of a torch, something that brings light as a certainty, security, something that shed light into darkness. He's referring to chaos and dubbed as something that's useful to illuminate the path. How is that useful? You know, we usually run away from chaos and doubt because it's like it's the opposite of certainty, security, clarity. And what he's telling you is certainty, security, clarity is a facade, is fake, is because every Control is fake. Yeah, constantly being able to question yourself, constantly having a doubt. You know, what Alan Watts called the wisdom of insecurity. It doesn't mean insecurity not as a paralyzing force. It's like, uh, you seem like you're right. You kind of seem like you're right too. Oh shit, I don't know what to do. You guys all seem right. I'm confused. Not that insecurity. Kind of like, yeah, you have a point. You kind of have a point, but being able to that step that you're talking about, you know, being able to understand everybody's position and see beyond the uh, you're right, you're wrong, allows you to see where people are coming from and allows you to have a clear mind to really see what the right solution is for this particular problem at this particular moment without attachment to ideology. But you're also making the call. You know, you don't just stop at the... Because uh, otherwise the trap of... Uh, freeing oneself from identities or freeing oneself from dogma the problem with that becomes total relativism it's all the same there is no right and wrong it's all sound it's well that's what i believe i believe that there is no right or wrong and but that's the thing is there is such a thing as objectively as health or not health i i agree with there that, is stuff that i agree with you, that there's stuff that heals you i you agree know? that there's stu- there's healthy and not healthy yeah. but i don't believe that there is right and wrong i think I think that if there was no religion, all human beings have a um, <clears throat> have an innate knowledge. I, I think that <clears throat> nature or God or whatever the hell you want to call it gave us all the tools that we need. Mm-hmm. The way like a little seed, a tiny little seed has all the tools to become a tree. Sure. Right. If, if it has the right water and earth and sunlight, it can become a tree, any seed. And I think that's the same thing with people. I think we all have unlimited potential and we all have a belief system that's built in us, you know, because um, <clears throat> I was talking to someone about health and people were saying, well, and, and they were saying, well, you know, people just need more education because they don't know what's healthy. Mm-hmm. And 
then they had this study or I talked to someone or I can't even remember how I came to it. And if you show a child a vegetable or a bar of chocolate, mm-hmm. they know without teaching them that the vegetable is healthy. Right. It's whether or not they're going to choose it. Sure. And the same thing, if you hit someone, you're a little kid and you hit someone without having religion or God or parents, you know that you hurt them. Sure. You feel the negative energy. They're crying. You know you did something that doesn't feel healthy, that mm-hmm. doesn't feel right. So I do think that we all have this natural, I don't know if it's a moralistic system or something inside of us that tells us that. Sure. And I think that then on top of that, we make these judgments that we judge as wrong or right. But it's just, does it make you feel good and healthy? Right. That's why the emphasis on right, uh, wrong or right is, again, it's try to oversimplify reality. Yeah. But at the same time, just because we toss out the more hardcore objective categories of this is the way it is, no, that's the way it is, it doesn't mean you just can't make a judgment call on what's... Because, again, he- I like the idea of healthy or not healthy because yeah. it's measurable. Yeah, it it's is. not this abstract right or wrong, you know, which... Which changes with wrong. everyone. Exactly. But in general, healthy or unhealthy people can tell. If you, you know, walk for 30 minutes, mm-hmm. no matter who you are, you're going to feel better because you're... It's, you feel sure. healthy, your body releases endorphins, so scientifically it's proven, and then physically you feel better. Yeah. So right? to me, that's why when looking at religions, you know, how do I decide which answers make sense, which ones don't? Or does this answer feel good like, or does it, you feel, do you feel guilty and awful? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> do I look at the results. What does it lead to? Does it lead to people being happier, nicer to each other and uh, that kind of A approach? Better person or being, does yeah. it lead you to be judgmental and wanting to kill somebody who has an opposite opinion because they are just, you know, that to me is telling a lot. I care about results. I don't care about ideological statement. I don't care about labels. I don't care about any of that stuff. The only thing I care about is what those ideas are going to make you do. How are they going to make you behave? If believing in uh, pink unicorns make you be sweet and nice to your neighbor, yay pink unicorns. You know, I'm totally fine by that. I don't care. I don't need to believe in the same thing. But as long as those ideas lead are there... Are making you have a positive behavior. I'm totally fine with it. And that's what it boils down to me. It's about figuring out what is that leads to very practical... There's nothing, there's nothing wishy-washy about it. There are very practical, almost objective results about, about what a certain behavior is. You make people smile, you make them happy, you makes you generous toward them, or it makes you a mean, selfish bastard who's out of school everywhere else. Because that's real, right? Yeah. That's very real, whether you go one route or the other. It's not subject... Because, again, some of this stuff, when we go against the right or wrong, good and evil kind of stuff, we sound it sounds like otherwise we're preaching this relativistic, you know, there is nothing... You know, it feels... To many people, it feels too wishy-washy. It doesn't feel like it's... But the reality is that, no, there is a very real element to it, but it's a little more subtle, it's a little less attached to labels, it's a little less than the traditional approach. But it doesn't mean that we're tossing away the baby with the dirty water the way that we're tossing away the reality that you do have to make judgment calls about what's healthy and unhealthy. Those are very real. The other stuff is not. It's a construct that we build on it. But I think there's a lot of similarities in... Um, I think people get too attached to the specific verbiage. Yeah. And I think that there's a lot of similarities between all the world religions as far as moralistic approaches to making people feel good and be a good person. And there's a lot of positive lessons. And I think because there's so many religions or, you know, and that I that need to identify with one thing and make someone else different or make someone else Right. That to me is one of the big ones when it comes to looking at religions is does your religion or I could apply to philosophies as well. But does your ideology, does your religion make you believe that there's only one right way and as such that means that everyone else must be wrong because you have it? Or does your religion emphasize an approach that tells you, hey, this is our way, but there's more than one way to get to it? But what I think is maybe they're all similar and because... Because people grew up in different regional areas, differences evolved or, you know, like, sure. like if there's a God out there, God doesn't say I'm a Muslim, I'm a Christian. God says I'm God. You know, well, he doesn't, it's, or he or she or the energy or whatever isn't identifying with certain things. That's a human thing. But that's because you are coming from a standpoint of a very inclusive approach that argues, you know, there's something in each, in everything, there is something good in 
Somebody who's coming from a very exclusive approach will come from the notion that religion means that there's a revealed religion, that God comes down from the sky, gives you this ideology, and you either follow it or you don't. That's a completely different way of looking at the world and what you bring up. Like, what you bring up, it's fitting with, you know, if you look at much of... Uh, but, to places, me, but to me, I'm sorry to cut you off, but to me... No, no. That <clears throat> someone who believes that it's so easy to disprove them, not disprove them in a, you know, to, to prove them wrong, but disprove them in the fact that if they have a belief system that's saying that I'm right and everyone else is wrong, well, you can't prove that until you die, right? Or right. W- maybe you won't even prove it then. Right. There are people who worship um, snakes or worship, you know, uh, do sacrifice, sacrificing a lamb. Well, what if you show up in heaven and God goes, well, where's your lamb? Right, you know? right. <laughs> like, like, what if they're right? So it's like, there's, there's so many obscure, even in with, within traditional religion, there's so many obscure miniature sects of that religion. Sure. Well, what if that person's right? Right. You know? So it's like, if you have that belief that only one thing can be right and everything else is wrong. Okay, that's fine. But then what if you're kind of almost being egomaniacal because you're saying, well, I know this of course, and everyone else is wrong. And even what, what made me feel that nothing that I could say was a hundred percent truth or right was, I don't know if you're into um, astronomy at all, but if you go to a very dark place where, cause LA, you know, there's a lot of um, light pollution. Mm-hmm. If you go out into the forest in the middle of nowhere and you look up into the night sky, mm-hmm. we are, a tiny speck of dust sure. in the corner of the butt crack of the Milky Way solar system of the universe. Basically, yep. <laughs> Literally. Yep. So if you, as a tiny little, and we're basically smaller than an ant, right. think that your belief system is the end-all, be-all, and you are 100% right about that, I mean, that's almost mental insanity. I agree. <laughs> and yet, that's when you look at the history of humanity, that's the majority of humanity. Because not only religiously, that's how, if you look at the main religions, tend to be that way, but also ideologically, again, when you really look at even just the last century or two, communism, Nazism, fascism, they're all based on that idea, you know, that there's only one right there's way. There's only one way. And so to me, that right there is one of the huge philosophical discussion is, where do you go with this? Do you believe in the one-way approach, which is exclusive by nature because there's only room for one? Or do you go by one that say, it doesn't mean every way is good because some you're going to test and it leads nowhere. And it feels unhealthy like or it's bad. There's or, yeah. more than one thing. Because it's like in one case you end up with, I don't know, China before communism where people could be Taoist, Confucianist, and Buddhist at the same time. You know, you could borrow from and you wear all of them at the same time. Or you look at the exclusive approach, which has led to religious wars, persecution, crusades, inquisitions, the whole thing, because there's only room for one. And so everyone else needs to be squashed. That's a very real difference, right? That's a very substantial ideological difference that leads to very different results. And so to me, that is one of those cases where it's like, even though I do believe that there are certain similarities, that certain threads that you find it just about every religion. I also believe that there are very strong, genuine difference that sets them apart. You know, mo- and again, there are exceptions because you know, if you look at most uh, Western monotheistic religion, they tend to be the exclusive. There's only room for one approach. But then you're gonna have some weird sect of <laughs> Islam or Christianity or Judaism that's not like that at all. You know? No, there are. There's like Unitarian. Is sure, a, is exactly. really good. Universal Unitarian. But is you know Unity ma- Church. The overwhelming majority of that particular religion be... has gone one way, and yeah. then there are obviously exceptions to that, and vice versa too. You're going to have you know some hardcore Buddhist fundamentalist, even though it's ridiculous because it doesn't fit. No, it's a true. It's argument, true, you know? it's... and people don't understand that because my, I'm not going to say um, who this person is. Someone I know, right, <laughs> is a very fundamentalist buddhist where i mean because when people think of buddhism in general they think of zen buddhism they think of very peaceful you know but i mean it's so funny because this person is so and almost the opposite of buddhism because they're so devout and this is that and and it's like and this person fights with another relative who's very christian and it's kind of like what you said the two fundamentalists that hate each other yeah. are being more similar absolutely and so when they fight it's just so funny to me because they're doing the exact same thing to each other yep. and their belief systems 
are not serving them. Yep. They're bringing out this unhealthy hatred exactly. and resentment and anger. And it just doesn't make any sense. It's like they might as well just not believe in anything because what they're doing is just proving to their own ego that they're right. That's why to me something. is Buddhism is good, Christianity is good or bad. doesn't mean anything. It's like his Buddhism is bad. Look at what he's <laughs> making him do. But look at her. Her Buddhism is awesome. It's amazing. You know, it's like... And that's real to me. Making a general statement about Buddhism all Buddhists are is, bad. Or, like, yeah, yeah. Come on, you know. And that goes for all the religions. You know, yeah. the percentages may vary. You know, the percentages of how many people I can get along with any given religion may vary dramatically. But there's going to be people in every single religion that see the world very much in a way that I can click with. And people that I'm gonna run as fast as I can because they are scary, bloodthirsty bastards. <laughs> so, you know, like, so uh, again, I'm not interested in what label you call yourself. I'm interested the behavior. in how does that inform your life? How does that make you behave exactly? Well, what I struggle with is um, I have been working on being more empathetic and compassionate and loving and seeing where people come from that have different viewpoints with me. But I'm struggling with having being open-minded with people who are not open-minded yeah <laughs> so i'm supposed to be open-minded but it's like it's almost like they put out the energy and you take it in because when i'm with someone who's very like you said exclusive and they mm -hmm. just want to have their way it almost makes me like that because i feel like when i'm around them it's so hard to be loving and inclusive yep. of them and compassionate towards them you know in fact one of the things that i go into in creator on religion is the what to me is the central paradox that one need to work on is the combination of being open-minded yet strong because you know strength is typically people who are very dogmatic and ultimately pretty mean tend to be very strong in their belief people who are very mellow sweet open-minded they are very healthy in that regard but also more often than not come across as weak and wimpy and not having a spine and having that combination of both is where, you know, if the choice is being between this strong freak or this weak, <laughs> sweet, amazing person, those, that's not a good choice. But see, this is what I have an issue with because I feel like the societies that... Okay, so because having a very set belief system and being very exclusive and, and having that strong personality is so external mm -hmm. and having inner peace and working on yourself and all that. so internal in history the things that have been have lasted <clears throat> tend to idolize the negative belief system of course so for example <clears throat> when i went to france right they have uh versailles mm -hmm. so versailles is just an example of pure ego sure right so uh who is it louis the Se some french bastard <laughs> yes. i can't 17th i can't no remember friends to the french by the way anyway so it's this giant estate and it's just, you know, the hall of mirrors and gold, everything. And so obviously this person had very little inner peace because, you know, if you're living simply and living the life of inner peace, you live in a very simple place and you give back to the people and this and that. But because this person was an ego maniac or Napoleon or whoever else is an ego maniac, that's what is represented in history and that's right. what we learn and pass down right so it in some ways i mean i don't want to say evil is more powerful than good but that external strength is it's easier if nothing else it's not easier but it 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 gets passed down more yeah. and so this inner wisdom is 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 not being passed down the way it should be even though it's the healthier viewpoint and that's why it's key for people who are going down that path to also develop a side that's very strong very assertive very i can play the game too if i want to but i choose not to and i choose to only you know it's kind of like when you speak about empathy to me empathy is key in order to understand where everybody's coming from to be able to feel what the world feels like if you are in their body. Uh, that's key step number one. But empathy to me does not necessarily mean that then I'm going to, oh, because I feel where you're coming from and I actually do see what you mean. Then it means that, oh, so what if you are an evil bastard who's doing this? <laughs> <laughs> I can understand you. I could be you. Yeah. The Hitler fact was I, a tortured exactly, artist. It, just the fact because I understand you does not mean that I'm not going to punch you in the face. <laughs> but I'll do it without too much anger. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's, 
understanding does not mean uh, oh then it's all the same you know understanding this is where you're saying is, strength with compassion exactly yeah. and knowing when to make the appropriate call you know in some cases i'll be able to be compassionate and sweet and because and that's gonna be the right answer in that particular case in another moment and maybe it's with the same person in a slightly different environment the thing that's going to get their attention the thing that's gonna make them snap out is not having just this mellow sweet vibe but is also call them on their shit and just be a little more direct and a little more but that's the the keys you need to know when to do which but i think people a lot of people who have the inner peace and the love and the compassion have a difficult time with the strength and that's why it's key to develop it otherwise you end up with a word that's this bullshit dichotomy between the strong bastards or the sweet weak ones and it's i don't not... think it's weakness i just i i just feel that people that have that tend to be like you said more peaceful and internal and i think I mean, even with our society, it seems like things that are glorified are the opposite of what's healthy. But the thing is, it does become weakness because at the end of the day, if uh, your inner peace lets some evil asshole run all over you, then, and, it is. Uh, then it's weakness, yeah. you know, and it's, it's understandable weakness, it's sweet weakness. It's weakness that if everybody was weak that way it would be a sweeter word, but the point is it's still weakness. And so having that ability to be peace in their world, uh, empathy, compassion. And punch and a bastard also, in the exactly, face. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and having choices at your disposal, you know, it's... Uh, Did you guys hear key. that? Are you guys listening to that? So all of my sweet, loving, hippy-dippy, transformational listeners, if someone's a jerk, it's not bad karma to give them back what they're putting out right yeah sometimes and again you need to know when <laughs> each one is when is the that, that's moment by moment timing <laughs> is the key is the very same thing that's an excellent response in that situation turns out to be a really bad response three minutes later you need to be able to read the situation read that person read the context read yourself to figure out what the right answer is and you're only gonna find out five minutes later when the interaction has gone a certain way and your action has led to something really healthy and great or is led to a bloodbath. And that's when you find out, it's like, oh shit, that was not the right response, I'm guessing. Well, that's why I like some of the soft techniques in martial arts, like Kung Fu or other things, mm -hmm. which you're kind of using the person's energy against them instead of, because you know what I'm saying? That's because, a perfect example. Because you're not, you're not, um, I studied Taekwondo, which is a hard technique, and I felt like it was like kind of similar to the exclusive. <laughs> right. <laughs> because it was about fighting and it was a tournament sport and it was about force on force. And of course, I don't know if you guys can see me, but I'm 5'5 five, five and about 120 pounds. So if a big guy comes at me, I'm not going to even, I don't care if I'm a 12th degree black belt, sure. I'm not going to be able to do anything to defend myself. But so if you're studying a soft technique, for those of you who don't know about martial arts, you're kind of using the energy, person's energy against each other. Aikido does that. And so I like that. I think that is a good example because you're studying it. You're, it's like you're focusing on being peaceful and loving but if someone comes at you and they're putting all this negative energy you're going to shoot it back at them and protect yourself but look at the example you bring up is perfect because it explains it there's the hard force against force approach then there's the soft use the other person energy but there's the happy hippie version of it that turns into the stereotype of it where it doesn't work okay where it's the <laughs> I'm just going to use no muscle whatsoever and just turn the thing. And it's like, yeah, let's try it, you know? And it's like, look at judo, for example. Judo is perfect as an example because it's based on Taoist principles about using the opponent's energy. And yeah, when you look at it, it's like, Jesus, there's a lot of muscle in there. It's like, how is that no muscle? It's not saying no muscle. It's using there's some muscle. as little muscle as needed to get the job done. As little muscle as needed, it may still be a bunch. So you're just really on, efficient. Yeah, that's what it boils <laughs> down to. So it's not so much as it's all force against force, which, you know, that's not an artist, whoever is the biggest, strongest guy win kind of thing, or it's all just pure energy and go with the flow. It's There's that, a middle ground. Yeah, there is. And you're going with the idea is the right one, the soft one. That's the right ideology. But the mean is not the stereotype of it, of how it's all uh, this no strength, all mellow, all energy. There is some, but again, you're using it efficiently. So it looks, it doesn't look like Tai Chi done by the old ladies in the park. <laughs> It looks like <laughs> judo, which is that, you know, their strength, but is not purely a, like I've gone with people who are physically 
I mean, I've seen this guy. I remember a judo guy that I look at him and I was like, are you ki-? Actually, two different people I can think of that when I look at them, I'm like, are you kidding me? One was really old. One <laughs> only looked like he was old. Like he looked like he was twice my age. And then I found out that he was my same age. And I'm like, really? This dude, martial arts? And then they step on the mat and he was freaky because these guys, I felt no, st- you know, there are people who beat me because they have done it longer. They are really strong. They are bigger. It's like, well, okay. I mean, yeah, you are good. You have good technique, but you're also physically a beast. And I can see how, sure. It doesn't tell me a whole lot of how good you are that you beat me. Then you go with these guys that look like crap <laughs> and they have these such superior technique that you feel no energy and you're getting tossed across the room and, and it's beautiful it's like how the hell i mean granted you know you if somebody at the same level of technique as this guy and they are strong they'll be they will win yeah but the fact is their skill is such that it can overcome a lot of strength it doesn't mean overcome all strength but it overcomes a lot and that's why you know you can be 120 pounds and beat people who are 50 pounds heavier great i haven't seen that but there's supposed to be i don't know what the um uh israeli what is the israeli? krav maga, krav maga yeah. yeah i haven't been but i i i had friends that went and saw a demonstration they had these little tiny jewish girls throwing guys across the room again demo is one thing you know <laughs> cooperative opponent is a lot easier to pull it off than when somebody's no, really coming your way but but there are i mean it does happen it doesn't mean that it's gonna work the way again everything else being equal if you have the same technique, the same experience, the same understanding, the same everything, the strongest guy wins, obviously. But the fact is not everything is the same. And so there are things that can overcome just pure strength in that regard, at least to some degree. Buy you some room. You know what I mean? It's like, I'm not going to beat a guy who's 250 pounds who knows everything I know. Yeah. But I'm going to beat a guy who's 250 pounds who knows uh, 5% of what I know. If they know 40% of what I know, I'm screwed because their 250 <laughs> pounds make up for that 60% knowledge they are missing, you know, but it, it's a, it's another element you throw into there. It doesn't completely eliminate the strength aspect, but it complicates it a little bit. But I just feel like people that are that more open-minded, inclusive, this and that, it, it seems like for some reason they just have that. You know, I know a lot of people that are really, really good people, but they have the nice syndrome. They're too yeah. nice. And so they do let kind of like the evil bastards walk all over them or take advantage of them. And it just seems like to me, I I still, be, you know, have my belief system and I still believe that you should, you know, try to be the best person and, you know, in and in inspire joy and inspire love. But if there is a room of 10 loving, you know, amazing people who have open hearts, but they just don't have that strength in one asshole, sometimes the asshole will run the show. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's why it's key. It's almost your responsibility because you are a nice, sweet person to also develop strength. Otherwise, you are, you are empowering some awful people and you're handing power over to them. That's why to me, in a martial art example, if you are a nice, sweet, mellow person, you should jump into MMA and the wrestling <laughs> and, you know, the more hardcore, assertive, tough stuff. If you are this naturally tough guy, you should go to the, the gutter. Yeah, go do Tai Chi and, you know, it's like you need it. You know, it makes you... To get balance. the balance. Absolutely. Absolutely. So to me, is the harder, more assertive, brutal stuff is for the people who are sweeter and mellow. That's what you should do. And instead, it's the opposite of what we do, because normally, is if you are sweet and mellow, you're going to drawn to things that are sweet and mellow. And if you are tough, and uh, that's where you're going to go. It makes you more of what you already are. It doesn't teach you anything new, you know? So in that sense, it's putting yourself in a slightly uncomfortable place where it's not where you naturally are already. It makes you grow more. Well, sp- okay, so speaking of comfort zone, so you, you said something about that with, you know, going the opposite. I know so many people who, first of all, I love getting outside my comfort zone. I will get out of my comfort zone in every way, shape, or form, except for physical pain. Right. <laughs> because um, I, me- I, will, I will get out of my, outside of my comfort zone mentally and emotionally and feel discomfort. I don't want to take any chances of physical pain. Right. I, 
I love I I think I'm on a roller coaster ride and this is the only vessel I get for this ride so I get to protect her no that's why it's like physical pain as in uh, serious long lasting injuries that's, yeah yeah I don't, I don't want to do wanna that stay, but, but, I, but physical pain as in just something that's annoying and ooh, a little scary it's <laughs> like well that you can do it it's probably it, it removes one fear it, yes, but so what? But what I notice is I I know a lot of people who are in their comfort zone, and it's causing them emotional and mental anguish mm-hmm. because they're not living their full life or yep. they're just doing the same thing over. Yet they refuse to leave their comfort zone. Of course, and it, it just it's seems scary. like it is scary. But it seems like being in the comfort zone is more uncomfortable than stepping outside of the comfort zone and learning and growing. But you know it already. And so there's that fear of uh, if I'm going to go into uncharted territory, it's going to be scarier and weirder. And so I'm just going to hang on to my somewhat kind of happy, kind of miserable thing <laughs> because I'm scared that if I go out there, it's going to devour me. Well, that's how I feel with the religious people I know who are, who are saying, I I don't believe in Catholicism, but I'm Catholic. Right, right, right. I feel like they're clinging, their whole family's Catholic. They don't want to disappoint their family. Yeah. And so they just say they're Catholic. They go to church and they are, they don't believe in it. Yeah, to me, that makes no sense. It's kind of like somebody who's saying, you know, I'm not really a Nazi. It's just that, you know, I grew up with my grandma, like the little swastikas around the <laughs> house, you know, and so I feel like I don't want to reject that identity. It's not really me, but, you know, I would make my grandma sad if I don't wear it. And I would, if I don't call myself, and that it's like are you crazy it's like <laughs> if you're not why would you if you don't believe it why would you call i just but a lot of sense. people do that i know i mean the main ones the main ones are catholic and jewish where i know people who say well i'm not really jewish but my parents are jewish sure, and sure, i sure. can't and and maybe that's just because of the region i live in but that those are the main two and oh i well i just think catholic catholicism is a bunch of bullshit but you know my wife is catholic or right. this and that and to me I would rather love someone and know who they are right, or know who they are trying to be than love someone who's saying one thing and being another, saying, well, I'm not Catholic, but I say I am. That makes me not trust the person because I can't... If you're lying to, about your whole identity, yeah. what else are you lying right. about to me? Of course. And so I would rather disagree with someone or than have them be inauthentic. But that's why on a fairly regular basis, you see those cases where you see the guy who chop uh, little children with uh, with an axe in his basement and then they interview his loving wife who goes <laughs> i never knew how is it possible he was always such a nice guy you oh, know and it's like because most people don't really see other people they are lacking in the empathy department they are lacking into which doesn't mean they are bad people it means they don't really what they see when they look at reality is a projection of their own fantasies and fears and whatever. They are not seeing somebody for who that person really is. Dogs will smell you and in 30 seconds will decide, I'm going to bite your ankle <laughs> or I'm going to cuddle up with you because and you're like... And that is so true. You know, we had someone who had a very negative energy. I mean, very negative right. energy. Try to deliver her mattress to her house. Right. And the dogs would not let him in. Of course. They were growling. They were they would not let this person in at all. And I think that maybe because they're simpler creatures or I don't know why, but they just get straight to the point, I like you, I yeah, don't like you. And every single time I go on a walk and my dogs kinda growl and bark at someone Usually it's someone that I kind of... Yeah, there's probably a good reason. Because they don't have that bullshit of, well, I don't really know you. How can I make a judgment? I'm not making a judgment. Is You creep me out. There's something <laughs> about you. I'm not saying you are an evil person. I'm just meddling some danger. I'm just meddling something unhealthy. And they I'm have just, that with each other. Yeah. Dogs will sniff each other and love yeah, each other and play and enjoy. Or they'll bark and growl and they won't like each other and it's not with every dog no it's a dog per dog basis and that's why it's that's some serious wisdom right there it's that ability to call it for what it is because you're not projecting stuff you are feeling what's going on just making a judgment yeah most people exactly it's funny when you know in marriages they are married forever and then like "Ah, that person i never really knew i guess and i'm like yeah no shit it's like (laughs) Uh, where were you in all this time you know what person you spent all that time with the person you really never got a feel for who they really are but i think some people and i know i've done this before it's like you want to see what you want to see right Right. so a lot of times people they they can't accept 
something about themselves. So, of course, they can't accept that about the other person. Right. You know, like a lot of people I notice have a very difficult time with negative emotions. Sure. You know, they avoid, they'll drink, they'll do drugs, they'll do anything not to feel negative emotions. But the crazy thing is, once you cry and get it out or if you're angry, you know, punch a punching bag or whatever... It goes away. Right. It doesn't go away totally. You know, maybe you'll have to punch a punching bag a couple more times or you'll have to cry. But in general, you're letting that energy release. You're letting sure. it out because emotions are temporary. They're not permanent. Sure. You know, you don't feel even happiness. You sure. don't, if you win a million dollars six months later, you feel a different way. Sure. So it's like, that's something too that I wish emotional intelligence was taught to children that feelings are not permanent. And you know, there's like suicides, like teenagers will commit suicide because they think I'm going to feel this depressed forever. forever. Right. And it's not. Right. And so belief system and not religion, but critical analysis of belief system and critical analysis of emotional intelligence, I think is just so much more. I mean, maybe it can't be measured, Mm -hmm. but it's life stuff. Yep, it is. You know, not everyone's going to use calculus. Right. But everyone is going to have an experience where they deal with a difficult person. The problem is who's going to teach you that? Because when you look at most teachers, (laughs) you're like... I don't mean to pick on teachers specifically in any because categories. Because you are a professor. Yeah, I hate most professors you know, <laughs> with a passion. I look at them and I'm like, really, you are going to teach me something? Are you kidding me? You know. And, and I agree with you because I had professors and teachers where I was zoned out and not interested and not engaged. And so in that sense, you know, that guy maybe is an awful human being, but he can teach you some specific skill. He can have a specific knowledge of, I know everything that happened during the French Revolution, and I'm going to tell you what happened on that day and that day and that day. Yeah, okay, that's a specific knowledge. That's not about wisdom or common sense. But if, yeah, who are you going to put in charge of the wisdom class? But that's why know? I think our society is totally backwards. Because back in the day, when we were living in tribes, they had, you know, the wise ones. Sure. Or they had the people with the most knowledge. Or they had... And the who would choose them was the tribe. Right. The tribe would say, this person seems to always make like the yeah, decent of decisions course, of course. or they had a council they yeah, had a council of, of wise ones where people would say okay what's the best thing for the tribe or what's the best thing for the community yep. and and you could go and give your opinion and then they would kind of delegate on it where now it's like we're electing these people or we're having people make decisions for us that are being you know based on money or based on lobbying or based on corporate guilt it's uh, too far removed it's, it's not too... it's not it's like we're doing the opposite of what yeah. is the healthy thing to do absolutely maybe not the right thing but the healthy thing yeah absolutely it's too far removed because you know once you go into institution and bureaucracy and all of that like even if you were to create the wisdom department in college tomorrow so to speak (laughs) i think we need to start sooner than college yeah but (laughs) college is too late yeah you're right (laughs) but who's going to decide who they hire you know who's going to be the the most people who are in charge of administrations of education today are you kidding me those are the people <laughs> who are gonna choose who's the why it's like yeah good luck with that Danelli. You know? that's why i think the whole society needs to collapse and we need to start <laughs> i truly believe this and it's awful but i think that society needs to collapse and we need to keep all the wisdom that we have over generations and learn from our past because right now what we're doing is we're in a sick system yeah which which is crazy because almost everyone agrees with it, yep. yet there's no, you know, it doesn't matter if you're Republican or Democrat or whatever religion, mm-hmm. everyone knows that there's something not healthy. Yep. Yet, it's like, I think that what I think is happening is that we're just evolving and evolving into this, this until because I believe that there is, balance needs to be had. And, you know, in the 60s, things were like revolution and change. And then back in the 80s and then left and right and left and right. And so I think that it just needs to get so bad that either the system's going to collapse or something's going to happen and there's going to be a huge social revolution because people know when you show someone a vegetable or a bar of chocolate, people know the vegetable's healthier. If you show people, you know, like you said, if someone's around someone who makes them laugh and smile and feel positive, they're going to feel that and someone who's negative and sure. you know, whatever. And I just think it's going to take, like you said, that critical mass of people saying, hey, yep. this doesn't feel right. Right. Um, and then uh, we're going to ha- feel a change, yep, you know? Of course. Um, we're going to wrap up. I wish I could have you here for five more hours. Uh, do you have anything else to promote for the guests? Life, the universe. <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, What's your website? Um, my name is danielebolaylo.com. It's, uh, well, do you have episode notes that you write things? I do, or, and yeah, I'll, I'll yeah, have a, I'll Maybe it's it. easier than trying to spell uh, weird <laughs> Italian stuff or, you know, the Twitter <laughs> thing or all of that. If you can put it in the episode notes, that way if anybody is interested, they can check it in there. And uh, I will, and you can get his book, uh, Create Your Own Religion at Amazon.com. And if you guys enjoy us, please like, please subscribe, and you can go on outoftheboxpodcast.com. And we just added a bit Bitcoin donate button. So if you have Bitcoins, we'll take those too. This has been Out of the Box. Thanks, guys. Subscribe. Yeah,